Hi, this is Paul. After today's video of about evangelism, um, I noted, that after I recorded that video on Friday, I noted the piece in The Atlantic by Tim Keller. Now, just the fact that Tim Keller who is a Presbyterian Church of America minister. Now, those of you who aren't aware of all of the intricacies of American Protestant denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America is a conservative Reformed church, and I say conservative in the sense that they don't allow women to be elders or pastors. He had a piece in The Atlantic. And again, just the fact that you can have a... Um, a conservative minister in a Protestant church. Now, again, Catholics and Orthodox work by different rules. They're, in the American scene, regarded as different from a Protestant perspective. You don't expect Catholics, you don't expect a woman to be Pope. And so, in that sense, Catholics aren't held to that um held to that standard. But Protestants are because of the history of uh waspy hegemony on the American scene um, into the Cold War. The title of Keller's piece was American Christianity is due for a revival, and I think that's true, and I actually think there is one underway. Um, are these things take time to work through the system? Our society is secularizing and Christianity seems to be in a long-term decline, but renewal is possible. February 5. Now, now, a lot of this article, I, I tweeted a, a quick reaction on Twitter to it. A lot of this article, to me, sort of is frozen in peak Tim Kellerism, which is, which is sort of in the mid, uh, between 2000, 2001 and 2011, in the, in the early part of the 21st century where Redeemer Presbyterian was growing quickly in New York City. It really encapsulated that moment right after 9-11. And that doesn't mean that I'm uh, that Tim Keller still isn't a vital voice in this space, but I have to say, reading the article, to me, it felt a little dated. Upon joining the Presbyterian ministry in the mid-1970s, I served a town outside of Richmond, Virginia. New church buildings were going up constantly. When I arrived in Manhattan in the late 80s, however, I saw a startling sight. There on the corner of 6th Avenue and West 20th Street was a beautiful Gothic revival brownstone built in 1844 that had once been the Episcopal Church of the Holy Communion. And now it was the limelight, an epicenter of downtown club scene. Thousands of people a night showed up for drugs and sex and the possibility of close encounter with the famous of the avant-garde. Now, yes, but in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, they were still building megachurches in places like um, Southern California and the suburbs of Chicago. So yeah, zip code means a lot. And in many ways, if you want to look at the decline of church in New York City, why don't you go look at Riverside Cathedral, which of course was built at the early part of the 20th century. And you have to look, you have to pay attention to the rise of the main line and the decline of the main line, because of course, New York City was sort of ground central for mainlineism. But of course, New York City will also be a place of immigrants that you're going to have a lot of vibrant immigrant churches that start. One of the most vibrant Christian Reformed congregations that most people in the Christian Reformed Church never hear of is the Golden Gate Church in San Francisco. And you would ask, is there a vibrant Christian Reformed Church in the city of San Francisco itself? Yes, it is. Um, it's made up of China. It's a Chinese congregation. They have services in Mandarin, Cantonese, and English. And my guess is the English is probably the smallest of the services. So um, remember, you're always looking at something from a perspective. Now, the main point of this video is not this article as such, but he says something that, that um, is important in this, in this article. 
Um, in moving to New York City, I had encountered a different world than that I'd known in Virginia, where society was secularizing. Religion in general and Christianity in particular were in sharp decline. In 1989, my family and I started Redeemer, a new church in Manhattan. We faced cultural attitudes towards Christianity that ran from the from deep indifference to mockery to shout out loud hostility. This is part of the reason Keller will say to Aaron Wren, I've always lived in a negative world and fair enough, but Again, all of these worlds have, diff have zip codes, and all of the dynamics within these worlds are different. Um, you can grow because there's a counterculturality about a local congregation that enhances and strengthens the congregation. You can grow a large, thriving, countercultural church in New York City. If Tim Keller had just sort of flipped and adopted all sorts of mainline postures and stances, church likely would have gone nowhere. If Tim Keller had decided to just be sort of a um, a, a dig-in-your-heels, uh, counter-cultural, let's say someone who was low in agreeableness, well, you might have gotten some things. And you can find, especially those immigrant churches in a place like New York City, New York, New Jersey, metropolitan area where I grew up. But Tim Keller sort of had this kind of winsome posture, and he was able to... Um, show a lot of evangelistic fruit. Now, we can talk about what that looks like. Evangelistic fruit from basically Tim Keller's methods, and I studied Tim Keller a lot in that period of his ascendance, was helping people see that Christianity actually gave contemporary New Yorkers some of their values in a better way than the generic um, liberationist culture around them. And that, that was pretty much Keller's shtick. And you can hear him describe that in video after video. He said, the gospel is a better way to achieve these values. Now, those values were often selective, okay? And that's sort of point for team antithesis. The values were often selective, but he could say, these values you can arrive at in a better way with the gospel and even the conservatism of the Presbyterian Church of America. All right. And, and I think uh, that that worked. <laughs> Tim Keller, on average, was more successful than most uh, pastors. Now, I was just having a conversation with a CRC minister, and he said, well, Tim Keller would have been successful anywhere. And I said, yeah. But I think Tim Keller would was more successful in New York than he would have been in, I don't know, suburban Dallas. Why? Because it's sort of the mixture of that antithetical, that counterculturality that can sort of give a countercultural church its own cachet, its own avant-garde, because a deep part of American culture is this mythos of the rebel. A while ago, I, I talked about, um, I, I had some, oh shoot, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> charismatic Episcopalian who was talking about Westerns and I still have to watch um, stuff to watch some interviews with him. But the, this this ethos I've been watching Yellowstone, and which is really just you know, another Western, um, which is sort of this. America has kind of this love hate relationship with the rebel. You have to be a rebel in just the right way, and in westerns, it's the it's the good bad man or the bad good man. I mean, you cheer for the Dutton family in. Yellowstone, even uh, even though they're racking up the body count and taking everyone to the train station. And those of you who watch Yellowstone will know what I mean. And, and so to be a, a, a thriving countercultural church in New York City that believes in things like the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ and the um, infallibility of scripture and male headship in the Presbyterian church. There's a degree of rebellious cachet that a church like that is able to muster and to grow, and it's, it's sort of an oddity. And so in thinking about Sam and Tripp and Bethel's conversation about that that was in the video that I posted this morning, 
they can they can build on some of that and yeah okay i can go to this building that is a pretty building and rainbow flags and but that that's just like the hr that's just like the hr um person at my business the the mainline church and the hr department have all the same beliefs why go because the hr department seems to have more teeth than the rainbow flag waving mainline church down the way that might have a pretty building. So I might go in there with a Saturday, but yeah, you might as well just convert it into some kind of hip club or coffee shop or in the Netherlands, we walked into one place that was selling, you know, clothing. What I've experienced in New York City for decades has now spread across the country. As in 2021, the number of religious nuns, people who don't identify with any established religion in the U.S. has grown to nearly 30% of the population, while professing Christians constitute 63%, down from 75% only a decade ago. Why should anyone besides Christians like me care whether the church revives? Many Americans would say that the church is inconsequential to them. Right here you can see this is this is Keller's regular move in terms of his evangelistic appeal. He will say that via Christianity, via belief in Jesus, via participation in the church, via all of this, you can achieve what you already value even better than um, a nice bottle of wine and a Netflix subscription. You can do better. You can do better than joining the Sierra Club or, um, you know, following uh, Greenpeace on Facebook. You can do better by actually engaging in, and then, you know, Keller's a very powerful, persuasive preacher. Many Americans would say that the fate of the church is inconsequential to them. Others want very much to see the church to continue to shrink. I shrink. I believe both attitudes are mistaken. Many secular um, social theorists, including Emil Durkheim and Jonathan Haidt, to name two, show how religion makes contributions to society that cannot be readily supplied by other sources. Cultural unity, Durkheim argues in 1890s, required a conscience collective. Ho, 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 ho. Pretty close to my consciousness collective. Look at that. Consciousness Congress. All those C's. Um, a set of shared moral norms that bind us together in a sustained way. These norms are understood to be grounded in something sacred and transcendent, not created by culture. Okay, now let's pause there. Something sacred and transcendent. I read that sacred list in the previous video, and that list continues to haunt me. Because what that list evokes is this idea that the sacred is something we can't seem to dispense with. It's built in in a deep way that we sort of feel it's it's not a social construction that can be that see, part of the so part of the reason people get excited about saying things like sex is a social construction is because they imagine that it can be transformed according to the moral norms that they think uh, they prefer and should guide the universe and so the good side for people in terms of motivation, why people get excited about saying such and such is a social construction is because we can change it. The nagging anxiety beneath that is if it's merely a social construction or a social convention, then it's not going to last. Then it's, it's sort of like in democracy, you can vote in your favorite party, but they can be voted out again. So, so now suddenly, um, a social construction is just up for grabs for the zeitgeist or the whim of the people. But Durkheim and Haidt, and now you're going to go Durkheim, Haidt, and for a lot of people, Jonathan Haidt was a gateway drug to Jordan Peterson. Because what this whole movement is going to, is trying to get at is, now I'm going to talk a lot about natural law. And some of you are going to get really excited because natural law has been a very, something that conservatives have been getting excited about. And the history of natural law is very interesting. Of course, it's been big in Catholic thought. And now it's very interesting to hear in this conference in Battleground, Washington, all of this excitement now in conservative reformed communities about natural law and excitement around Jordan Peterson about natural law. But most of that natural law excitement is coming from a conservative space. And the, the excitement is, well, well, here's finally sort of a, a 
a really strong argument for traditional marriage. And, and behind Jordan Peterson is really this, this way to sort of repristinate and make natural law more compelling. And in the same way, it's, it's the same with Jonathan Peugeot, because Jonathan Peugeot is, is not using the Bible primarily in sort of a fundamentalist, modernist war kind of place, but, but Jordan Peterson and Peugeot are using the Bible to say, this is the structure of reality. And when Jordan Peterson does his biblical series, he can use the Bible to say, well, these dynamics in the garden don't necessarily point to, let's say, um, a video camera version of Adam and Eve in the garden where you can watch the serpent's lips move, but it points to uh, structural, fixed, non-arbitrary foundations that aren't social constructions, but are permanent in the system. And once you know these permanent things in the system, then suddenly you can bank on them. And then the the opportunity motivation within us says, okay, well, once I know the structure, well, now I can build on it. And, and science has long been this kind of thing. And so it's very interesting where, where Keller begins with his paragraph where basically saying, you and I want the same thing, but I'm going to argue with you that I can get there better, faster, um, more lovingly, less selfishly via the Christian method than you're trying to get at it via your basically watered down mainline methods. And, but now we're, we're moving to Durkheim and Haidt. Durkheim recognized the difficulty, difficulty secular cultures have in cultivating moral beliefs that are strong and unquestionable enough to unite people. Again, there's something that you don't want it to simply be the whim. Remember, Nazis came into power via democracy. They were voted into office, and that's a, that's a nagging anxiety underneath democratic systems. Another nagging society underneath anxiety underneath democratic systems is that more brutal systems will win because of, let's say, game theory. Consider the evolution of America. In the classic 1985 book, Habits of the Heart, read that in seminary, the sociologist Robert Bell and his co-authors showed that the, the social history of the United States made it the most individualist country in the world. He had Sheilaism in the book. I've read the book on my channel. American culture elevates the interest of the individual over those of the family, community, and nation. But remember here, the anxiety is sort of fragmentation, and so you want kind of a structuralism. You want something that isn't arbitrary. You don't want something that's a social convention. You want something that is sound and permanent, for two decades, American religious devotion counterbalanced this individualism with denunciations of self-centeredness and calls to love your neighbor. The church demanded charity and compassion for the needy. It encouraged young people to confine sexual expression to marriage and encouraged spouses to stick with their vows. Okay, right there, this whole compassion. Basically, Keller keeps saying, you want to be compassionate? If you give your heart to Jesus... You will be more consistently passionate than just someone who aspires to be because that's what the social convention says a really good person is. And that's a powerful argument. Again, this is, this is in many ways what Tim Keller does. Bella wrote that American individualism, now largely freed from the counterbalance of religion, is headed towards social fragmentation, economic inequality, family breakdown, and other dysfunctions. And again, this is, this is what Keller does. He'll say that, well, you don't want these things. You don't want social fragmentation, economic inequality, family breakdown, and many other dysfunctions. Christianity is a way to, to, um, to mitigate those things because Christianity is a, is, a, is a religion, religious effort that Durkheim and, and hate, Haidt and Bella show that, you know, sort of brings, so Christianity is an answer to the values you already have. Now, that's not a dumb thing, again, because a la Tom um, Holland, Christianity is already deep in the value system. And what many people have is they maintain um, a value system that is legacy Christian, legacy, um, legacy wasp American Protestantism, and now... Keller just can basically come on underneath and say, we can simply re, we can get those roots going again and we can get your family working better, et cetera, et cetera. 
At the local level, churches provide community support to people in their congregations who lack strong family ties and other emotions and social support. They also serve neighbors who do not attend church, particularly in poor neighborhoods. Again, these are values that liberal urbanites have and can keep showing these are the values that churches bring. Now, a lot of these people are like, yeah, we want churches, but we're just not going to go to them. And we want them to have all our beliefs, and we want them to have the sacrificial, we want them to practice the sacrificial social qualities that give churches the impact in the neighborhood. Now then, Keller's going to have an uncomfortable truth to give them in a minute. They also serve neighbors who do not attend church, particularly poor neighborhoods. More than 20 years ago, a University of Pennsylvania study of Philadelphia congregations concluded congregations are vital to the social fabric of Philadelphia and take a major role in caring for the needs of the people in the neighborhood. The study estimated the replacement cost of churches and communities and government would be around $250 million annually in 2001 dollars in the Philadelphia metro area alone. Now, Tim was teaching in... He might have been teaching in, um, he did teach in Philadelphia, so he's, he's got some time in Philadelphia. He lived there. But, but his point is that churches are good for the city. Now, what do churches require? Churches require that, um, that there are people who go there voluntarily, give voluntarily, serve voluntarily. And it's one thing for people who go to church who serve the, serve the city, excuse me, serve the city with their time. Because in America, people have more money than time. And so it's easier to give a little donation. It's harder to give your time. That's one of the things I noticed between uh, ministry in the third world and ministry here. Ministry here, get people to give their time. Um, well, that's changing. Um, well, we'll see how this goes. Anyway, where well, revival of the church would benefit society, that will never happen if the church thinks of itself as just another social service agency. Because, I mean... Just go ahead, found a social service agency and say, okay, I have um, inner city do-goodery here in Sacramento. California's not really inner city, not like Patterson or East Coast because the cities work differently. But I have um, uh, bless the poor do-goodery. I want all kinds of people to sign up and give their time. And, well, people do sign up and give time to things not like churches. And go back to um, uh, High on God. The book by James Wellman, who I had a conversation with him in Trip, because James Wellman basically said, you know, this churches <laughs> and mega churches do really well. They they actually mobilize people, people give sacrificially, and and studies are tremendously consistent on this. That religious people, generally speaking, outgive, outserve, outperform morally non-religious people. John Verveke himself will agree to this because it's just a it's just a fact. It's a social science fact, but it's a fact. But here's the critical thing where here's the here's the important move that Keller's going to make. And again, this is completely consistent with how Keller works with this stuff. While revival of the church would benefit society, that will never happen if the church thinks of itself as just another social service agency. Christians seek spiritual renewal of the church, not because they seek religion as having a social utility, nor because they want to shore up their own institutions. First and foremost, Christians help society because its metaphysical claims are true, they are not true because Christianity helps society. When Christians lose sight of this, the church's power and durability is lost. There's, there's his big switch. Basically, it's not unlike the idea that that I have worked on a lot here, which is, well, you know, um, believing that Jesus rose from the dead and died for your sins and, and sacrificed himself, that radical generosity displayed on the cross, um, that can change your life but only if you really believe it. If you just see it as just another nice picture, well, you can look at all those pictures and it won't really change your behavior. You won't go to church. You won't, you won't, you won't, this is where we get into the Jordan Peterson stuff. You won't either, you won't both pursue the prize that's ahead of you and fear the judgment that's behind you. Okay, now we're getting into Jordan Peterson stuff because why, when Jordan Peterson has his self-authoring program, you both write about the person you want to become and you write about the person you're afraid you might be becoming. It's because Peterson understands that psychologically you both have goal pursuit and threat avoidance. 
And so it's not only the it's not only the benefit of achieving of achieving heaven, it's also the anxiety and fear of running from hell. Okay? And you know, you notice that with Peterson, he always brings both of that in. Now the question that's really interesting right here at this point in Keller's piece is Christians seek spiritual renewal of the church, not because they see religion as a social utility, nor because they want to shore up their own institutions. First and foremost, Christianity helps society because its metaphysical claims are true, and they are not true because Christianity helps society. Okay, right there. But notice, it's metaphysics first. And this gets into this question of, oh, okay, well, that sounds, you've got metaphysics, and then you have epistemology, and then you have axiology, and go back to the Paul Maxwell, really lovely 30-minute introduction to um, philosophy. It's probably still on the internet. I don't know. He's, you know, I don't know that he's around as much as he is after he left Christianity. But that tends to be the way that churches work. If I can, and just, just watch how many of these conversations we're having, if I can convince you of the metaphysical claims, then suddenly the epistemology and the axiology, what you actually do, your values, your behaviors, then those will follow. Keller in some way sort of flips the script on that and says, let me find points of agreement in the axiology. Let me find points of agreement in the value matrix that works in, obviously, a society like ours, which has so much Christianity built into it. And then let me show you how embracing the metaphysics and acting that out liturgically and making having a Christian conversion can then help you actually live out the values you aspire to live better than your secular neighbors. And again, you can throw in very traditional Christianity. Well, why can't my secular secular neighbors do better? I know some next secular neighbors that do quite well. You might say, yeah, but it doesn't really scale because they're just sort of eaten up by their own desires. They, um, they spend more of their money on themselves. They, they tend to get hung up in bad marriages or too many divorces or drug problems or alcohol problems and they you know they, they fritter their life away on amusements and pleasures whereas the the earnest christian disciple on mass again you'll find some exceptional people granted but on mass christians will mobilize themselves in communities they'll have structures of accountability and as a group they will lift a city far more than these secular do-gooding institutions it's Keller's argument. But remember, it's metaphysics first. And metaphysics has been exactly the point that the church has struggled with. Now, on to the rest of the video. There is a revival that is underway. Just ask Justin Brierley. He can see it. A lot of us are seeing it. And of course, it's got a very strange preacher at the center of it, one that doesn't attend any church regularly. Isn't that strange? I think if you understand Keller, and, and this goes all the way back when I first discovered Peterson, I was like, huh, what's going on around this guy? And so then I started, I went on Reddit and I started reading YouTube comments, et cetera, et cetera. And then I started noticing there was one comment that I saw from one guy, and I began seeing it in multiple times. I used to listen to Tim Keller. Now I listen to Jordan Peterson. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I didn't know much about Peterson then. I thought, why? Why would someone who listened to Tim Keller start listening to Jordan Peterson? And of course, once I started making videos, once I started talking to all of you, suddenly a whole group of you, natural law, natural law, natural law. And you know, a lot of you noticed my reticence. I don't talk a lot about natural law. Um, created order, you'll hear me say. That's much more of a Dutch Reformed sort of counterpart to natural law. But of course, natural law was very much sort of a Roman Catholic thing. And there are reasons why Protestants traditionally, but now they are, and that's very interesting, Protestants traditionally didn't really go down the natural law way. And I, I'm going to touch on some of that in this video. I think Part of why Peterson is is sort of, how to say this, participating in this revival has everything to do with the reimagining of natural law. Maybe I'll change the slide title and uh, 
because all this stuff is really loose. It's all just me thinking. And if anything, with Jordan's sort of new United Nations, the United Nations has its foundation in 20th century Protestant natural law. The United Nations, just read the United Nations, United Nations Charter, Declaration of Human Rights. It is deeply the product of American Protestant, mainline Protestant mid, mid-century ideas. Now, the mainline church was rocked by the civil rights movement. And I've talked about that before. And the mainline church has been um, in serious decline. And the serious decline of the mainline has been taken, um, has basically the, what they have dropped, evangelicals have picked up in the 20th century. And that's a, that's a story that continues. But really what's, I think, a big part of Jordan Peterson's participation in this revival is the reimagining of natural law. And, and this is, and in seeing this, I really see, it really helps me see why sort of where Keller fits into this progression and why reading Keller in the Atlantic feels a little bit like 20 year old. This is, I mean, Keller's church took off after 9-11. And Tim has been retired for a few years now. His idea was to split up Redeemer into other congregations. I have no idea how Redeemer is doing now. Some of you out there might know and you can let me know. My guess is it is not, it does not have the kind of cultural power that it had in, let's say, 2010. Even though, again, I Tim Keller is an amazing preacher. Um, I've, I, I've heard wonderful things about some of his latest books. I'm sure I will read them. Um, big, to, big Tim Keller fan here. But I think what's been happening with Peterson is part of this movement of the new revival. Now, why? Now we're going to go back through some history. If you read C.S. Lewis's The Discarded Image, in broadest terms, there was a synthesis of the classical world, the classical Christian. I mean, a lot of what happened in those initial centuries of Christianity and the growth of the church, how the church took over the Roman Empire, was a, a, a worldview, a synthesis of a worldview began to take form. And we've talked about that before. The earth is not the center. It is kind of, but the earth is the lowest, uh, the almost lowest place. The only place lower than earth is hell. But the earth, and you go up into the heavens, and then you know you go up into the ether beyond the moon, et cetera, et cetera. Just look at the whole, just look at the whole medieval cosmology. Obviously, with some deep ties to Aristotle. Okay, so it was a Christian, pagan, classical synthesis that governed the world, and began to break down in late. Um, in, in the late medieval period and would eventually be unseated by what happens, especially sparked, I mean, the, the Protestant, I would say sparked by the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation is another part of that larger movement that unseated the classical medieval synthesis. All right. And Paul, Paul of Tarsus, see my Roman studies. Paul helps put these churches, these worlds together. So this book, which is kind of a fun little, um, this this book is basically about the history of interpretation of the book of Romans. And he looks at, oh, just a whole variety of ancient interpreters and origin. You know, so you've got most of these chapters you have, Let's see, who do you have in this one chapter? So you have Origen, you know, one of the early interpreters, Augustine, Abelard, Aquinas, Luther, Erasmus, Wesley, Karl Barth, and then New Perspective and Narrative Approaches. And that's there he's writing about um, this one particular passage on uh, Romans 7 and 8. Origen's focus, 
when Origen read the book of Romans, Origen was saying, Paul is trying to bridge the Hebrew and Hellenistic world. And I think that's right. The Hebrew, it's the letter to the Romans. Paul was trying to reinforce that bridge and the, the early church would grow from the bridging that Paul put together. You know, go ahead, Jacob. You can leave your comment. I know you will. Church fathers worked on that project and put it together, as did Origen. And, and so Augustine of Hippo in the, in the Western Empire did the same thing with Neoplatonism. So you had all of this development to put together one cohesive Christian philosophical world in which you have this, this development from the classical period into Christianity, and that holds through the medieval period. And... and Natural law was very easy to imagine because there was deep alignment between the world that they experienced and the world that they saw in Scripture. And they had all kinds of ways to put that world together. Now, of course, with Copernicus and the, you know, that's going to start getting unraveled. And Lewis, of course, will, will write about that. Now, one of the interesting things that one of the interesting one of the reasons that Jonathan Peugeot is so interesting is so this was at Thunder Bay and he presented a um, he presented just basically the right hand and the left hand you can find he's got a video on that too on YouTube what what struck me though was the iconographic language you know they they it you won't find a manual instructing, okay, so you have to paint pretty pictures on the walls of these churches that you're now allowed to build because Constantine has made Christianity legal in the empire. Here's how you're supposed to draw all the pretty pictures. No, 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 no. It's This is their language. These are artists. And this language develops of the right hand and the left hand, and Jonathan Peugeot goes through all these things. Well, what does that mean? That there's an... There's an iconographic language that emerges in the patristic period in the triumph of Christianity in the empire. And of course, it fuels the triumph of the Christianity in the empire. It's set in there. But, but look, at, look at how the people look. It's clearly a language in terms of what angels look like, what saints look like. Um, and they're very intentional about what they do with their hands, what they're pointing to, the other figures. Again, just watch Peugeot. Constantine, whether he's adored or reviled, facilitates the reign of Jesus as king in some ways in a return a return to Israel's monarchy, an end of the God of Israel's exile. So in many ways, Jesus is now coronated by the empire as king of the world. Thanks to thinking about Jordan Peterson and his London thing and Seeing, seeing Jordan Peterson in sort of in the light of Constantine and the spirit of Constantine, I picked up a, constant, a biography of Constantine. The introduction says this, The Roman Emperor Constantine changed the world. For many millions of people across this planet, an institution that he introduced and promoted has become a central part of their lives. They use or hear words that, we, that he approved. In the 21st century, Constantine is the best known as a Roman emperor who converted to Christianity and in so doing made it possible for Christianity to become a world religion. Without, Christ without Constantine, Christianity probably would not occupy the place that it does today. But now the second statement is probably more profound. Without him, it is unlikely that Christianity would have emerged from the mass of conflicting if often quite similar, belief systems coexisting in the empire into which he was born. Even if there are few practicing Christians, fewer practicing Christians than there were a couple of generations ago, the immense impact of Christian thought upon the behaviors and thinking of many generations who came after Constantine make it very difficult to imagine a world without it. Now, there's a lot of debate as to this person sets Constantine's birthday in not in the same time that many authors do. But this point that he makes here, 
Without him, it is unlikely that Christianity would have emerged from the mass of conflicting, if often quite similar, belief systems coexisting in the empire into which he was born. What Constantine did didn't just sort of bring Christianity, because when we think about it in low resolution, we said, think Christianity as a thing sort of takes over the empire. Okay, fair enough. But what the relationship with the empire and the emperor and how that developed turned Christianity into a kind of thing. Now, over the years, there's been a ton of debate about that. It's quite common for Protestants, especially in their anti-Catholic mode, to um, to curse Constantine. In fact, it's it's sort of been a Protestant staple in many places to imagine that you have this wonderful pure church of the early, um, the very early church and the, the apostolic period, and then suddenly it gets corrupted. And the big baddie in terms of the corruption of Christianity is Constantine. Of course, not for the Orthodox. They love the guy. And, and for the Romans, mm, yeah. And, and so then you begin to see this this different this this different way of sort of putting the world together and boy there's 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 a ton that you could you could talk about with um, with this kind of thing now I just wanted to put two pictures on the screen here so sorry for those of you who are listening and enjoying your um, your ad free existence I just had a whole talk on on CRC Voices about ads. So yeah, you can use ad blockers. Ad blockers reliably block the ads here. They do. Or YouTube Premium or just listen on audio. But those of you who are watching, or you can watch on Odyssey too. There's no ads on Odyssey. Those of you who are watching will notice that, you know, the pictures that come out of these Orthodox churches don't look like the pictures in the Renaissance period. Why is that? You know, you don't hear about church um, ancient iconographers in the patristic period of the church digging up corpses to study human anatomy to make sure that all of the people in these nice little icons have proper anatomy. That's physical correspondentism, right? But you look at Italian Renaissance, well, they're studying anatomy a lot. Look at, look at Jesus' body. Doesn't look like a superhero. Jesus' body looks like you know, kind of a pasty white Italian. Um, and Thomas, of course, you know, peering in, you know, looking for his liver. But notice, you know, balding. There's something to this. The iconography is intended to relate something and they're not really so terribly hung up on whether you're going to get all of these saints on the right hand and left hand of Jesus anatomically correct. You know, if you just look here, Mary's a pretty tall lady. And look, at boy, they, they all skipped leg day. But, but look at the Renaissance, you know, you get those, you get that, and that, you mean, just look at Jesus' chest there. You know, almost a, almost a photo realism. And of course, this, this struck me after my conversation with the, with the, with the art collective. Something's going on there. Now, this is a return to the sources. Now, when I say physical and literal, you all think I'm talking the way we use literal. Watch Peugeot and that guy. Literal means this is a return to the sources. And the Renaissance people, in the Renaissance period, they are drawing pictures of Jesus and they want Jesus to look like you and me or the you and me back in the time of the Italian Renaissance. They want Jesus to look like these are the people in my neighborhood. They want Jesus to look like, well, we're going to get the anatomy right, so we're going to dig up corpses and really study human anatomy so we can portray it like we do. That's Renaissance. That's not patristic iconography. And that same was happening with the Bible. So if you go to my videos that I started making in, in 2018, you'll find this great course a lot. I should probably re-listen to it because I'll hear all kinds of different things that I didn't hear then. The Philosophy and Religion of the West by Philip Carey. 
And he talked about the, this return to the sources. And this is where you get Erasmus and Luther, where they are, they are going back and they are checking the readings. And they are, um, you have this renewed interest and availability of classical texts. And now with the printing press, Erasmus is saying, here's Jerome's Vulgate, here's a, a Greek text that we have, and here are my notes. And you know what? Jerome's Vulgate looks more like mythological or universal history, what Peugeot and Richard Rowland are talking about. That's what Jerome is doing. When Jerome is like putting together the Vulgate, putting together the Bible, and he's just going to make sure that the Bible is correct in terms of all of the theology. And in fact, if there's a few words missing, he'll make sure to put them in so that all the stories have everything in it. And in some ways, if you look at, I'm not going to get into the whole King James thing. Erasmus begins to undermine Jerome's Vulgate in this sense because Erasmus is just looking and saying, we have older Greek texts. Now pay attention, just look at, think of, watch the way we're thinking about history. We have older texts. Jerome is putting stuff in. Well, it's sort of like having, you know, Alexander the Great go to Jerusalem and say nice things about the Jews and, you know, and even... It's sort of like, oh, what was it? Oh, it's it's um, Josephus. You know, Josephus, one comment that seems to get close to Jesus, and then suddenly there's this, there's this really amazing, almost a confession of faith in Josephus, and people got very excited. And then a little bit later, people said, no, that was added later. Josephus didn't write that. Other copiers wrote that. Well, why did they feel... Why did they feel the liberty to add that? Well, it's, it's, it's the same psychological package as mythological or universal history. They're piecing their world together. And something changes whereby we're not seeing, you know, the right hand and the left hand of Jesus and, and all these patristic-looking pictures. We're having artists who are digging up corpses and trying to get the anatomy right. And it has a different impact on us, doesn't it? We might look at those pictures, I mean, Jesus with two different eyes, and it's like, what's with that? And then, of course, Jonathan Peugeot will come in and tell you, and tell you, show you all the features. It's like, oh, oh, oh. Suddenly you're learning the language. But when you look at the Renaissance, it's like, that's a much subtler way of communicating, isn't it? So this is a return to the sources. Luther builds on Erasmus and finds in the older Greek text reasons to question the mythological history of the Vulgate. Go to uh, Carlos um, Erie's rec um, the Reformations. These titanic changes that happen in the Western world. You have the Columbian Exchange. Martin Luther is a product of the New World, even though he never left the old. Because Columbus, you think about Columbus and these ships get all the way over to America and well, what are these? Are they people? Are they people like us? Now, again, if you watch, it was a real struggle for the Europeans to think about these, these very different cultures from them as people. And it's really easy for us to be really hard on them, but pay attention, the Native Americans did the same thing to each other. The Diné, the Navajo. What is it, Anthropologists have gone through the world, and you know what everybody calls themselves? The people. You know what everyone else is? Not the people. Gentiles and Jews, barbarians and Romans. Again and again and again, human beings do this. And so Europeans go over to the Americas, and they're like... And, and either they go up, well, these are, these are noble heathens that have been untainted from all of the sin of our world. And so these are, these are angelic creatures. Watch the mission. Or the other way, these are subhumans and they're animals and worthy of our subjugation so we can subjugate them for all sorts of things like beasts of burden. It usually goes both ways. The titanic changes of the Western world, the printing press, now suddenly... Print can be ubiquitous, and it's cheap. Urbanization of Europe and the rise of literacy in the middle class, the decay of the feudal system, pervasive interpretive pluralism, um, eventually undercuts the certainty of the text and our ability to reinterpret it. Now suddenly, well, you know, 
if you wanted to know what's true, just read the Bible or read Aristotle for physics. Now, well, don't read, you're not going to get your physics from the Bible. You're going to get your physics by going to a tower and tracking the movement of spheres in space. Because you know what? You have the Catholic and Protestants lands there, but you know, if you drop that sphere in a Catholic land and a Protestant land, it's the same in both. Oh, now we have something to build from. Natural law. And then Christians, of course, studying God meant studying those spheres. God can speak, you know, Belgic Confession. God speaks through two books, General Revelation, Special Revelation. God speaks through dropping spheres from towers and measuring them. And God speaks through the Bible, both. But it's different. Yeah, it is. The heavens declare the glory of God. You'd find that all the way back in the Old Testament. You're figuring this stuff together. So rationalism and empiricism sort of become, well, if we can't agree on the texts and we can't interpret the texts together, maybe we can construct a value system based on the speed at which spheres fall because that does, they fall the same in Catholic countries, Protestant countries. They, they fall at the same rate in the new world. They fall at the same rate in India. They fall at the same rate in China. Now suddenly we have a universal platform upon which we can build or rationalism, logic here, all this logic works the same in any of these places, right? This is all stuff I ran through in 2018. Enlightenment physical correspondentism as truth. And in many ways, this is the system that is now passing because I should pull up that, that piece. Hmm. Remember this? Oh, you think it's just a table. Oh, it's just a table. A table is just a, a box. It's just a thing. And so we're going to construct our world on all these things. And now, thanks to cognitive science, we realize that a table isn't just a thing. The table is, is a top and some legs and, and a table. A tree stump can be a table and you can buy a table at Ikea and a countertop can be a table. Or someone leaning over... For you to sign on their back, they can be, a person can be a table. No. And so this Greg Enriquez system where, well, there's this material realm, there's the language-based conceptual understanding, there's the nervous system mediates the informational flow, genes code the cells that make up the body, and you have all these pieces just to, it's a table. Well, yeah, but a table is not such a simple thing. So this physical correspondentism as truth, relics, and universal mythological history are sort of a pair. Did this really come from Jesus' cross? And I was reading this one. So in Constantine's time, you had well, church building in Jerusalem. And well, then suddenly, well, you know, if we can find the place where they laid Jesus down, maybe we can find pieces of the cross that they hung Jesus on. The power, um, the rise of the power of, of manipulation and the technology of truth science, the rise of deism. First of all, God is so consistent in dropping those spheres from towers that they fall in. It's, it's easy to imagine a universal God because that, that sphere drops at the same rate in China or India or Milan or, or, um, or Germany or the Netherlands or England or the Americas. It falls the same rate all over the world. Therefore, that's what God's speaking through the, the speed at which a ball drops. Hmm. Well, if God is that consistent, he doesn't seem to be a personality. Maybe God is more like a system. Maybe God is more like a set of rules and laws that we can explore and establish and they don't change. And whether I pray or don't pray, that sphere falls at the same rate. It's not that the sphere falls at a better rate for saints and a worse rate for sinners. It just falls. Deism. Return of the metadivine impersonal realm in many ways. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll pray to gods to intervene in that falling sphere. But for the most part, in the metadivine realm, it just falls. 
reason, empiricism, science, technology for the physical world, Christian legacy for the world of values. So again, now we're having a split world. Values, we get those from the Bible. Physics, first we got it from Aristotle. Now we get it through observation with a combination of reason built in there. So now we have the split world. And that goes all the way into the Cold War period where, well, godless communism, but our values are Christian. And then after the Cold War, values begin to come under fire. And then this man, Charles Darwin, followed by Herbert Spencer. Darwin now, before it was, well... With deism, God made the universe, but we and God are sort of the second class of persons. And now suddenly with Darwin, we don't need a God to explain who we are. We're not made in his image. We're just another, we're just another sphere falling. We're just way more complex than spheres falling in space. Right there, you begin to see the beginning of the meaning crisis. This, this, this privilege of humanity now is lost because functionally we're just um, we're just smarter apes, and then we discover we're not even smarter. We're just more cooperative, or or we have better self control, or or or. But there's nothing special about us. There's nothing special about anything. There's just nothing special. So Darwin completes the task of deism. You don't need an acting, choosing, conscious, relational God. You had a mechanism to account for the diversity of life. Herbert Spencer turns things towards us with social Darwinism and racial hierarchy within humanity. And you get the beginnings of, of this atheist naturalism. Now, I want to play some of, uh, a couple weeks ago, The Rest is History had a really interesting series on the rise of the Nazis. And I want to play some of that. Absolutely it is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I think across Europe, not just in Germany, but across Europe, you have deep anxiety about modernity, all sorts of political and cultural and social tensions. So you see it in Britain, for example, in the Edwardian period about votes for women and all, all these sort of things, um, about culture generally, distrust of sort of abstract culture and the new music and all that kind of thing. But in Germany, there, there are... I think we can identify, let's say, the 1880s and 1890s. I think a lot of historians would say Nazism is in many ways a creation of the 1880s and 1890s. You can see the ingredients. The 1880s and the 1890s across Europe are, are being re intellectually are being reconfigured by one big idea, which is Darwinism. Yeah. And what Darwinism does is to upend the fundamentally Christian idea that the rich have a duty of care for the poor and so on, that there is, a, there is a value in being, you know, in weakness, if you like. And it upends that, at least the- And that's not the only Christian idea it upends. It slowly begins to erode on other things. And a lot of, a lot of things pick up on that. The way that, that Darwinism comes to be expressed, the idea of uh, survival of the fittest and so on. And that provides intellectual sanction for, you know, European countries across the board at their their political, you know, their economic, their military, their cultural apex, basically to go around kicking sand in the face of anyone they want to. I think that's probably true. I think Darwin is, Darwinist ideas, I, I, I agree with you. I think they permeate into all kinds of different areas. The idea of competition, the idea of struggle, the idea yeah. of a kind of inevitable confrontation. And as you said, actually, Tom, I think you're probably right. A disdain for weakness that perhaps wasn't so strong before. And therefore, a kind of an anxiety that different peoples are in a race and that if you drop behind, then you're going to be crushed. So I was kind of looking at this uh, in the context of all the various themes that will feed into Nazism. And it's very kind of international. So you have, you have a German, Wilhelm Marr, who in 1873 is recalibrating Christian anti-Semitism in very overtly Darwinian terms. That, yeah. that it's not about religious prejudice. It's about the fact that there are differences within the blood. Yeah, and he, he absolutely... So he, he, he's, he's ex now, now, notice here that this particular level, this physical level, now becomes the, the, the key level for everything. 
So you really see racism. You know, there's always been bias among different groups, and you had a um, you had a tribal anti-Semitism that rises and falls, but now it becomes a racial anti-Semitism because, again, of of how this is developing. Explicit yeah. about that. It's not religious. It's racial. It's racial. And he he coins the word anti-Semitism, and it's something he's tremendously proud of. And he. 1879, he founds the League of Anti-Semites. So that's the yeah. German angle. But then in France, also, you have, as you said, this incredible strain of anti-Semitism. And it's in France that um, thinkers coined the idea of, of the Aryans as a master race, the kind of people from the north as, a, as, as people who should properly be the rulers. I mean, it's kind of an odd thing for the French, you know, it's, it's um, what's his name? Gobineau. Yeah. And that gets translated into German in... Um, 1898. So that's obviously also part of it. But then there is also this British figure, Houston Stuart Chamberlain, who who writes this work, The Foundations of the 19th Century. And he further kind of refines this idea that history is forged by the competition between races. And he posits that the two great races, the two racial groups that have kind of retained their original purity amid all the miscegenation that's been going on, are the Aryans and the Jews, and that the Aryans and the Jews are locked, therefore, in a contest for global supremacy. And you can see how, you know, this Anglo-French-German swirl of ideas is going to feed into Nazism. But it is there, you know, it's it's not specific to Germany. Right, agreed. Houston Stuart Chamberlain, he was a, an old boy of um, Tottenham College, Tom. Is and he? he's drawn into this anti-Semitism because he's a passionate liberal would you believe? So he hates Benjamin Disraeli. He has an absolute loathing of Benjamin Disraeli, who, of course, has Jewish ancestry. Uh, interestingly, Chamberlain marries the daughter of... Richard Wagner. Richard Wagner. Yes. Yeah. So Wagner is a hugely interesting figure. Um, of course, he's, for some people, he's tainted because of his associations with this. Okay. But you, 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 begin, to get the, you begin to get the sense of what's happening here, where... You have natural law, and it's built into the world, and it's all physicalist. I mean, the, the problems with the Jews are in their blood. It's not in their religion. It's in their blood. It, you can read Timothy Snyder. It gets very, it's very interesting where there's a – I remember I first started to get onto this when I, I first listened to Tom Holland talk about Nazis, and he was saying, these Nazis are radical environmentalists. And it's like, what? Nazis are radical environmentalists. And if you start sort of tracing this down, this level of physicalism begins to make sense. And so if you read Timothy Snyder in Black Earth, the communists all want to have sort of this social structure that's going to allow the eventual evolution away from the state. But the Germans, when they're conquering places in Eastern Europe, keep trying to get rid of institutions and structures to allow natural dynamics to take place. And for them, it's all mechanistic. It's racial, it's evolutionary, it's natural, and all of these, I mean, part of their resentment of the Jews was that they thought, well, the Jews brought Christianity and all of these ideas of, you know, respect for the poor, all of those kinds of ideas that Tim Keller is now basically saying to modern New Yorkers, well, you know, you want, you know, cruciform, respectful generosity to the poor, and you see how this is in competition with your hedonism. Well, if you want to really live your values, you should become a Christian. Now, you might say, well, well, what happened? Because you can see how eugenics fits into this. Well, what happened was, um, what, what happened was that the, the rest of the world begins to see where this goes. I mean, just read almost anything before the Second World War. Not almost anything, but... Eugenics, you will find eugenicist arguments very common before the Second World War. The Scopes trial is about, am I on my next slide already? I think I read that. The Scopes trial is about um, Herbert Spencer as much as it's about Darwin. Well, I'll back up a little bit. So during the Second World War, of course, Lewis is going to try to reach back to the Tao and the older natural law. But the tensions with Darwin remain in Lewis. Uh, nature is red in tooth and claw. So natural law, and this is the thing. If you read the Beatitudes, 
I just preached on them a little while ago. If you read the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, <laughs> there's nothing natural lawish about the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, blessed are the strong, for they will overtake the world. If you read Darwin, this is what the Nazis were saying. Nature is red in tooth and claw. But beneath the modernist fundamentalist fight is this fight over Darwin. Now, it's usually framed as science. But again, go back and see William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan, in some ways, is trying to save natural law from Herbert Spencer. Even though we sort of had this split world morally, thanks to Hitler, the Americans and the, the Western powers that win, they basically enshrine in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, they enshrine this order of human exceptionalism, which cannot be found in Darwin. Well, Darwin didn't talk about people that much, but that's where it went. Um, all of the, the, it's the fundamentalists that in many ways are mitigating against natural law because natural law now has become red in tooth and claw. That's what we see in the world. Natural law before the Enlightenment was, well, you know, the music of the spheres. This Aristotelian medieval synthesis in which there's a good God and human rebellion and we're in the low place and we seek to rise and climb and, and you know, go up the ladder. Adolf Hitler did what Brian couldn't, but as a cautionary tale. Now... If you go back and you watch my video that I made, Establishment Protestantism won the culture and lost its Christian identity. In the counterculture, all of this changes, okay? Natural law is in many ways undermined. And the story from the 1960s until now has been one of big transformation. People in their they might still retain some of these Christian values, as, as Tom Holland notes, but their worldview is very different. Um, it's natural for the lion to eat the lamb, not to lie with the lamb. Well, of course, um, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the Jewish, the Jewish uh, ranchers who had goats and lambs understood that lions ate lambs. David understood that lions ate lambs. But, but what happens is that, well, victory in a sense of the West and the Second World War made all of these things invisible. Victory and sublimation of the establishment Protestantism in American culture. Um, the mainline church becomes the blue church. And the religion just becomes the way things are for people. And that, that in many ways is a good definition of your baseline religion. It's just the way the world is, as it really is. That's your religion. And, and in many ways, this, this tension that Christians feel is, is that's the deconstructing tension. Um, new atheists attack Christianity for not being moral enough, but they, of course, unwittingly have their values derived from sublimated Christianity. And you can hear way more about that in the Establishment Protestant video, won by the secular, um, won the culture and lost its Christian identity. And this is where Jordan Peterson comes in. Because in many ways, he is taking Darwin. He's not denying Darwin. He's a Darwinian. But he is reconstructing a natural law that has both the Bible and and Darwin, and he's using psychology to do it. Okay, so this talk he gave in Israel, I thought was a really good example of, um, let's see, how long is it? Uh, we're going from 40 minutes, about a half hour. A really good example of, okay, this is where this is what Jordan is thinking and doing right now. And as soon as I saw him through the lens of natural law, some things started to come together. Really? Okay, so... I thought I would talk about <clears throat> three things tonight, responding to the previous two speakers. I'd like to talk about stories. I'd like to talk about unity. 
and I'd like to talk about responsibility. I'll talk about responsibility in relationship to something like sacrifice. So let's start by talking about stories. So I think the most fundamental discovery of the last 75 years on the cognitive perceptual front, and, and that would include, in some strange way, the domain of literary analysis, including postmodernism and also artificial intelligence, uh, the, the, the construction of autonomous robots, which you may notice aren't here yet. Um, there's, there's, there's been a convergence of both investigation and conclusion on those fronts, I would say. In some sense, because all of those disciplines ran into the same problem head on, at pretty much at the same time. And that was something like the problem of perception. And the problem of perception is a very deep problem. And it's a problem that undermines the objectives of, pure, of both pure rationalism and pure empiricism. And, and so you'd say, in some sense, it undermines the claim to totality that's part and parcel of, the, of an overextended scientific enterprise. Okay. So now we're talking epistemology. How do you know the world? And you know the world... This video is a little low, so I'm going to lower my, lower my sound level a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, I'll try and get these sound levels right. This world of objects, you go right back to maps of meaning. First sentence, you know, first paragraph in maps of meaning, you can construe the world as a world of objects or a form for action. It's right there. The problem is this. The world appears to be too complex to perceive. And so, if you look at any even single object, although it appears to you as a unity, if you analyze it in its totality, it's composed of a multitude or even an infinite of subsidiary unities, and it's in a context of an equal number of unities above and beyond it in almost an infinite array. In, in short, there's almost an infinite number of ways to perceive a particular object. Now, it, it seems self-evident to us because all we have to do is look at the world, and there the objects are, but you have to understand that a huge part of your unconscious cognitive processing is devoted, will concentrate on visual perception, to visual perception. It's a very neurologically intensive process. So part of the way that you solve that on the visual front, because it's particularly intensive visually, is that you only have a very small part of your visual field that's high resolution. It's called the fovea, and each cell in the fovea is connected to 10,000 cells in the primary visual cortex and each of those to 10,000 more cells and that kind of exponential increase adds up to a very large number of cells so if you wanted all your vision to be as intensely high resolution as the center point of your vision which is what you point at the world constantly bit by bit, partly unconsciously when things attract your attention and partly consciously when you direct your attention if you if your whole visual field was as intensely high resolution as your fovea, you'd have to have a head, head like a space alien just to keep all the brain uh, functional. And so, I could imagine doing something, imagine that you were trying to paint a photorealistic representation of a single cup and a flower on a table. You think of all the hours you'd have to spend doing that, capturing, say, all the reflections in the, in the glass, in the, in the cup, all the subtle play of light and how that would transform across the day too so you'd have to stabilize the lighting you'd have to stabilize the conditions exactly so that that object would remain constant enough so you could attend to it for the hours or dozens of hours or weeks or even months that it would take to portray it in all of its detail because everything is singular in some real sense as well as universal and so the problem of perception is a major problem and it's associated with this problem of a plenitude of underlying facts. We should let the facts guide us. No problem. Which facts? Oh yeah, that's a problem. Because there's an infinite number of facts. It's not just a little problem, it's a big problem. And so when robotics engineers started to design systems that could act in... So what he's doing is talking about how the modern world, the enlightenment world, the world of, well... God speaks with the falling of spheres, 
all over the world, that is being undermined. That is going away. There's a new natural law that is coming. In the world, they had to, they started to design systems that could perceive the world, and then they found out that that was just impossible. They had absolutely 100% no idea how to crack that because all the obvious boundaries between things and all the obvious reasons that objects seem self-evident to us aren't there in any simple sense in the world. Uh, partly it's because we map functional utility onto objects, and so we actually don't perceive objects. We perceive meanings and infer objects. And meanings are only relevant to something that's deeply embodied, or maybe even something that's alive. Or maybe even something that has a soul, who knows? So when I see this, it's a speaker, and the reason for that is because sound comes out of it and I can hear the sound. And when I perceive that, it's, it's something I can sit on. That's why a beanbag and a stump can both be a chair, despite sharing virtually no objective features in common, apart from the fact they're both made of matter, which isn't really much of a commonality. And so you can sit on a stump and you can sit on a beanbag and therefore they're both chairs and I suppose those tables could be chairs too because you can sit on them. There's a functional element to object perception and it's not secondary. It's not like you see the object and then infer the function because the way your nervous system is set up, the fovea pattern recognition systems map directly onto the motor output systems even before they map onto conscious vision. And so there are people who, have, uh, who are who are blind, who tell you they can't see anything, but if you put up your hand in front of them and you ask them to guess which hand is up, they can guess with 90% accuracy. And they also respond psychophysiologically to flashed faces that show, say, uh, facial expressions associated with anxiety or fear or, or pain. Now, for some people, you might be thinking, why on earth are we talking about this? We started talking about narrative. Okay, then he stopped, went away from narrative, and now we're talking about brain science and we're talking about perception and I think for a lot of people for Jordan Peterson a lecture like this is just kind of blah 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 pronouns blah 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 or blah 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 conservative natural lawism blah 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 done and and or blah 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 politics blah 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 done Jordan obviously thinks that all of this stuff he's talking about now are integrally important for even the stuff that he posts on Twitter. Well, what is the connection? He's, he's laying out the end of the modern world. And okay, well, you can't not live in a world. You have to fill it with something. And of course, Jordan is going to say, the world that we live in is a world portrayed in narrative from the Bible and... The Bible actually teaches us how to live. Wait a minute, I thought you're some arch conservative. Nope, nope, it's not who he is. And so they can't see, but their eyes can map the meaningful patterns of the world onto their bodies. And our visual systems are complexly layered like that. They map onto us at multiple levels of analysis. And so we have to see the world. We see the world as a meaningful place. We see the world as a meaningful place before we see the world as a world of objects. Now that's something, if it's true, that's something. And then you might ask, well, what is the structure of meaning through which we see the world? And that's the next question. What is the structure of meaning through which we see the world? And the answer to that is, that's what a story describes. And that's why we love stories, because seeing the world Seeing the world so we can navigate through it, let's say. Seeing the world so that we can make our way forward. We can participate in the ex hodos, the way forward, let's say. Means we have to see the world through a story. Now, the postmodernists figured that out, and that's part of why their critique of science is actually quite devastating. Because they did make the claim in some real sense that the scientific narrative, the scientific process has to be nested in an underlying narrative. And that turns out, I would say, to be true. So two thumbs up, perhaps, to the postmodernists for that. And again, I mean, earlier I talked about the fact that, well, if everything is sort of arbitrary, if everything is a social construction, then we can make the world the way we want it. Oh, but then anybody can make the world the way they want. And if we don't have power, then we're probably going to be out of luck. Oh, it might be good news if, in fact, there is a structure to the world. 
if there is something above and beyond humanity's ability to manipulate it and control it, if in fact the world isn't perfectly plastic, and if in fact there is something built into this world, oh, you mean like a natural law? Yeah, but that natural law, that, that natural law has like, what, isn't that what gave us Nazism? No, I thought the natural law gave us Catholicism. Oh, but then there was the natural law of Nazism. And now Jordan is going to come down and say, no, the Catholics, they have their point. We understand the postmoderns, but how exactly is the world? About discovery, where they went wrong and very deadly wrong and politically wrong and wrong in an intellectually prideful manner, I would say is they failed to notice the magnitude of the mystery they had discovered, which is, for example, that any given text is susceptible to an infinite number of potential interpretations, which is a postmodern claim, leading to the idea, for example, that it's very, very difficult to assemble anything like a canonical set of books, because if one text is susceptible to a multitude of interpretations, then certainly a canon of texts is susceptible to an even larger multitude of interpretations. And so then you might say, well, which interpretation is canonical, which is the argument of every argument, right? Which text is canonical? That's the core of every argument. If you can't solve that for a paragraph or a single text, how can you solve it for a canon? And the postmodernists allied in some sense with the Marxists, and for many of the same reasons, the desire to bring the margin to the center, let's say, jump to the conclusion that the narrative that we impose upon the world and always have is one that is nothing but the expression of naked power. Right? We hear that all the time. It's all about power. Okay, so a lot of people listening is like, blah, 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 power. Postmodernism, power. Oh, 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 okay, yeah. Oh, oh, the power thing. Oh, I've heard him talk about this. This is good because this is where he's going to beat up on the postmodernists. But he just already said something that the postmodernists got something, right? So, you know, the resolution is just kind of creeping up a little by a little. Power. It's all about power. What's history? Well, it's a power dynamic. It's a power dynamic between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Ah, uh, so see that natural law, that, that natural law after Darwin, where it's just power. And, and of course, Marx, where, well, yeah, it, this, is, this is physical history evolving. You know, Hegel, a little bit too much Geist up there. Marx sort of brought it down into this, into this material world of tables and, and things and objects. But, um, but that's that nature's red in tooth and claw. This is natural law is the world is just about power. That's the natural law that's functioning in a lot of people's minds and a lot of people's hearts. And part of the reason why a good God is unbelievable because all there really is is power. It's a power dynamic between com competitors in the in economic environment. It's all power between men and women. It's all power. That's history explained in one term. What's the present like? It's all power. It's all domination. It's all oppression. It's all that's natural law expressed in one term. It's all victimization. It's all naked power. That's convenient for you if you want to express power because if that happens to be the ethos by which you live, then why wouldn't you use power to put yourself forward in the world? If that's the landscape itself, and that's the fundamental Marxist narrative, but not only the Marxist narrative, it's, it's a deeper story than that. I would say Marxism is a branch of the claim that the world, the rule, the proper rule of the world is the spirit of power. And that's wrong. And not only is it wrong. Oh, he's preaching now. He's under he's undercutting this assumption of natural law. He's saying, no, natural law isn't about power. Not only is it wrong technically. And it is wrong technically. It's also wrong morally. It's wrong technically because... Oh, we're putting the world together. Remember the physical world and then the, you, you learn the physical world from science and then you learn the moral world from the Bible? Jordan's saying the physical world and the moral world are coming from the same natural law text. As those creatures, including non-human creatures, who rely on power to attain... Pre, to attain prominence or status, do that in a very unstable and inefficient manner. Why unstable? Those who live by the sword die by the sword. 
And Franz de Waal, who studied behavior in chimpanzees, our closest primate relatives, has showed very cl clearly that the most successful alpha males are not the ones who use dominance and force, but the ones who engage in the most reciprocal activity and are the best at peacemaking. Did you see what he just did there? He just footnoted Jesus, and some of you didn't know. He lives by the sword, dies by the sword. Yeah, that's 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 one of these little proverbs out there. That's a truism. That's that's uh, that that just floats around out there. Gosh, wonder where he got that. Wonder where wonder who first said that. Jesus. Oh, France de Waal, a primatologist. You know, we've, if you've listened to Jordan Peterson for five years, you've been hearing about France de Waal. You saw him on the channel. Um, all this. You know, we, we've got we've got you know we've got tickling rats. We've got ape hierarchies. We've got. G Jordan Peterson is constructing a new Christian natural law. He is footnoting Jesus with Darwinian science. That's part of the reason Jordan Peterson is sparking this revival. Where it goes, I don't know, but this is a big piece of it. And so, so much for the biological argument. And then on the human front, so we are, there is a subset of people who rely on power to maneuver their way through lives, and those people are called psychopaths. And I'm not kidding. That's exactly, precisely accurate, because for a psychopath... Now we have a new psychological class of sinner. There's nothing but his own narrow, immediate self-interest, and you are there to serve that function, and that's that. And then you might say, well, how successful are psychopaths? And maybe you're cynical, and you say, well, everyone who's successful in business and politics is a psychopath. And then I might say, well, to the degree that you're successful, is that because you're a psychopath? And if it's not true for you, well, maybe it's not true for them either. Now, it is true upon occasion for a small subset of people, and that stabilizes at somewhere between 1 and 5% of population. Okay, he's going to undermine this natural law of nature, red, and tooth and claw that psychopaths inherit the earth, and he's going to say, no, the reciprocal inherit the earth. Biologically speaking, with the mean around 3%. And what seems to happen is that if the number of psychopaths falls below to about 1%, everybody forgets they exist, and they become incautious and allow them to proliferate, and then they can raise up to about 5%, and then everybody starts to see that the psychopaths are coming out of the woodwork and, you know, hits them back with sticks, and then they fall back to 3%. But if 97% of the world, world's population, the world's individuals, are making their way through life on non-psychopathic principles, then there's no way that you can say that psychopathy and the power drive that drives it is a successful strategy. It's not. And so it's not power. So it's wrong technically. Now, Duwall has also shown that... Again, well, if maybe the world is made in sort of a good way. So, and, and you can see his, his conversation about the dark triad or the dark tetrad, where he's actually putting together somewhat of a theodicy with respect to, well, maybe it's important we have at least some psychopaths in the world, but not too many. Chimpanzee males who use power to, to dominate their hierarchy are very much likely to, re, to meet an extremely violent end and who have very short lives. And if you know anything about the history of tyrants, you might, you might derive precisely the same conclusion. Then you might ask yourself as well, if you want to have a successful relationship with your wife and husband, are you going to base that on power? So one of you is a tyrant, one of you is a slave, and that's supposed to be the recipe for a stable, iterating, reciprocal relationship that lasts decades? Good luck. Try it out. See how well it works. If you're a man, you're going to find that women aren't that easy to oppress. And if you're a woman, you're going to find that... If you're an utter tyrant in your feminine way and you demand too much, all you'll do is demoralize your man to the point where you want, won't want to sleep to him, with him, and that you'll feel that you're in your own special kind of well-deserved hell. And so it's not the basis for a stable relationship, and that's partly, and this is also extremely important. You imagine that there's, there might be one rule that would govern our interactions if we only had to interact once, and that rule might be, I can dominate and win. I never see you again. I can take everything you have, and that's the end of it. But that's not the world that we live in. The world that we live in is a world of iterated interactions, right? Multiple games played over very long spans of time with many people involved. And so there's an ethos that emerges out of that that's something like an ethos of fair play. And people abide by that, and it's because 
It's a deep instinct and it's a deep moral calling to be reciprocal, to treat other people as you would like to be treated. And that's a good antidote to the ethos of power. And it's part of a much deeper story, which is a story that I would say the people of Israel originated in large part. And so, and so then let's talk about unity. Um, here's, here's what unity does psychologically. You're either unified, which means you're pointed in a single direction, and that your attentional priorities are linked towards some integrated aim, or you're aimless and hopeless and anxious. Because if you're scattered all over the place because you don't have a central narrative, then anxiety emerges to signal the path, pa to signal the fact that you have too many competing alternatives in front of you. You're disunified. Consequence, negative emotion, anxiety in particular, which signals entropy, which signals disunity. So that's a marker of not being unified. What's the other marker? Most of the positive emotion that you, ex you experience, we know this neurophysiologically, most of the positive emotion that you experience that makes life worth living, analgesic positive emotion, Anxiolytic positive emotion, the positive emotion that gives you hope and curiosity and drives you forward, that's experienced in relationship to a unified goal. And the higher the goal, the more hope and positive emotion that's experienced as you view yourself making incremental progress towards the goal. So you need a unified goal that's transcendent in order to quell anxiety and to give you hope. And the technical details of that, I would say, are already laid out. So that's, you, now, so that's on the individual front. If you're not unified, which means in some sense that you're, the ethos, the spirit that inhabits you is not, um, uh, is not, it's a plethora of deities rather than a monotheistic structure. If it's a plethora of deities rather than a monotheistic structure, you're anxious and hopeless because you're scattered all over the place. So what happens socially? Well, socially, you're either unified or you're not. If you're not unified, then what are you? Well, you might be diverse, possibly, although you can have diversity and unity, which is what happens in a healthy and well-established family. But if you have no unity socially, then you have disunity. And if you have disunity socially, well, what do you have? You have confusion and hopelessness, and that degenerates into outright conflict. So without unity, the anxiety levels in this society and the hopelessness levels in this society mount to the point where people are at each other's throat. So no unity, no psychological health. No unity, no social peace and stability. And that's that. And that's why the... And as natural law scales beyond the individual to the societal. Durkheim contribution of the idea of monotheism was such a massive contribution because it was an intuition of the idea that all human motivations, all functions of perception, all forms of interaction had to be melded into something that had a transcendent unity that was posited out into the future, that constituted an aim and a, an aim and a psychologically uniting principle and a socially uniting spirit. And to the degree that we all abide by that socially unifying spirit, then we're sane and peaceful and productive and generous. And that's not the ethos of power. Quite, quite the contrary. So, in, in, with regards... Okay, I'll, I'll, I've got one more thing to add to that. The story. So, what's the antithesis to the spirit of power? Well, that's partly what's laid out in the biblical corpus. So, let's so imagine that there is an a spirit that's antithetical to the spirit of power, maybe the spirit of deceit, maybe the spirit of pride, the catastrophic spirit of dissolution. It's a complex spirit because a transcendent unity has to unite everything, and something that unites everything is very difficult to apprehend as a unity. And so what the biblical corpus does is it aggregates a set of micro-stories which are representations of the transcendent spirit that unites us psychologically and socially. That's the nature of the biblical corpus. And the human imagination, or God's divine providence, take your choice, has picked these stories because they each shine a characterological light on the nature of the spirit that unites us in the highest possible sense. So we can walk... Okay, now, part of what's interesting about Jordan's theology of the Bible is it is, in fact, Darwinian. It, um, it, it out-competes, and it out-competes in a natural law way. It out-competes because it's more accurate. It out-competes because of its fittedness. It out-competes because it's the best among the competition. So here you see this very interesting, this very interesting 
both use of Darwin to put together a new natural law that has the individual and society and accounts for the, the narratives that, that, um, that sort of co-develop with us as we grow. We, we need narratives. We're upper and lower register. We need narratives. And so there's this theology of the Bible. Walk through that relatively quickly. So in the story of Adam and Eve, God is not least. And this is a God as character or God as model for ritual emulation or God as, yeah, God as central narrative figure. That's another way of thinking about it. God is the spirit that you walk with when you're not self-conscious in a well-tended garden. Okay, so why do you have a garden? It's precisely so you can do that. To forget about yourself for a minute, to engage in the apprehension of something balanced and beautiful, a walled garden, the proper, the proper integration of culture and nature, and the proper apprehension in that situation frees you of your self-conscious burden. And so for a moment you enter that transcendent state that's associated with the Edenic paradise. So that's God in that story. Later in the story of Adam and Eve, God is the spirit that calls you to conscience when, like Adam and Eve, you've bitten off more than you can chew. In the story of... Now, he's an effective preacher. Look at that, bitten off more than you can chew. Okay, he's using Proverbs. You're integrating that into it because bitten off more than you can chew is just a, a nice homiletic term that will sort of settle down the audience. They're comfortable with it. and Cain and Abel. God is the spirit of conscience that calls to you when you've made improper sacrifices and are facing the consequence of your unwillingness to go all in on your life. In the story of Noah, God is the spirit that calls to you if you're wise, when trouble is coming and you determine to batten down the hatches. In the story of Abraham, God is the spirit that calls the overprotected and unwilling despite their resistance out into the adventure of their life. In the story of Moses, God is the spirit that calls to those who are oppressed and in slavery to free themselves from the grip of tyranny, whether it's their psychological tyranny or whether it's the tyranny of the state. And so all of those stories point to an underlying transcendent unity of character, let's say, which is the proper model for worship and celebration and ritual emulation that's united, that's the antithesis to the let's say, darker and more multiplicitous spirits that might rule the world. And part of the religious enterprise is the, is the elaboration and understanding and then the incorporation, ingestion, and modeling of that spirit in your own life. And to the degree that you do that, you do what the Logos did at the beginning of time in Genesis. You use truth truthful speech guided, let's say, by love to confront the transforming horizon of the future, the chaos and potential of the transforming potential, transforming horizon of the future, and turn it into the habitable order that is good. And that's a manifestation of the image of God that men and women are made in. And Responsibility. Responsibility in some sense, that's maturity, but I would also say that's the adventure of your life. And how is that tied to the idea of sacrifice? Well, I, I've not yet heard him say, look at response. Res it's right there in the word, responsibility. What are you responding to? I mean, he's already sort of fleshed out this natural law, narrative, transcendent, narrative God. That's what you're responding to. You're responding, you have the call of God in all of those um, patriarchal stories that he's just laid out, those first stories from Genesis. That's the, that's the response. What do you have to sacrifice if you're responsible? And the answer is you have to sacrifice your short-term hedonic and immature whims, right? So if you're a child, if you're two, you're impulsive, and that means that you only act for the moment, and you only act in relationship to what it is that you, as a singular individual, want in that moment. So now he's picking up on the countercultural thing, because generally speaking, as a culture, we have been in a hedonistic era. And when Tim Keller, Tim Keller says, these are all the values you really want, this is how you can get them. You can get them with 
Christian discipline, devotion, community, um, all of these things. Now, remember, Tim, Tim started with the metaphysical. Well, once you get the metaphysical, then you get all of the other things too. Um, Jordan comes out a little bit differently and says, okay, responsibility here is, is where you're going to have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and drag it up the hill. And that's just not a tenable solution to the complexities of life, because you don't just exist in a moment. You exist as an iterated set of identities across time. You yourself are a community that extends across time. Now, now in many ways, um, this equilibrated state and Piaget, where he sort of puts this together, this is his eschatology. And you have to govern every action that you take in the present in relationship to the fact that you can do what you want tonight, man, but you got to put up with yourself tomorrow morning. And you got to put up with yourself for what you did tonight, next week, and next year, and five years from now. And every single one of your actions is like that. And so in order to act properly, you have to sacrifice the impulsive gratification and the easy way out that's characteristic of the moment and extend yourself across time so that you are acting in concert with the highest interest of yourself in the broadest possible range of context. And that's what it means to be an adult. And, you and, and that's in some ways a psychological functional equivalent to the judgment, you know, standing before the judgment of God. And, and Jordan's put that together in other ways when he talks about ideal, when he talks about any ideal is actually a judge. It, it's sort of a psychological equivalent there of, you know, the, the final judgment. You do exactly the same thing with other people in a relationship, in a marriage. You're not just who you say you are from moment to moment. You have to negotiate very carefully with your wife or with your husband on an ongoing basis every week, every moment in some sense while you're communicating to understand not only how you can get what you need and you want, which may be necessary and, 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 and important, especially in the long run because you have to treat yourself properly, but so that you can do that in a way that your partner can also get what he or she needs and wants in a way that makes both of you more likely to get what you need and want over the long span and more so than you would get if you were alone. And again, people are, life after death, I'm skeptical about that, but this sort of life after now communicates. Whoops. And if it wasn't the case, why would you bother with it? And then you have to incorporate children into that too, and that gets to be a more complex unity. So if there's five of you, well, how do you balance your individual needs and wants with, the co with that small collective? And that's the negotiation process that goes on in a family, and hopefully you do that too in the spirit of reciprocity and truth and love. And you take on that responsibility, and that's the core aspect of sacrifice. Right, the, the great discovery of the human race. That's what sacrifice means. And you make, you sacrifice the foolishness of yourself. You sacrifice the momentary foolishness of yourself to the highest good that you can possibly imagine. And there's nothing in that that isn't good, even though it's difficult. And so, and that's not mere inhibition of those impulsive gratifications that if only were allowed to be manifest fully would set you free. Quite the contrary, you would have precisely the freedom of an extremely badly behaved two-year-old. And that's no freedom at all, right? All that is is freedom to wander in the street and get crushed by the first car that drives by. And, and so now this is sort of an, 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 an analog to Christian maturity where it's self-denial, it's mortification. And there's nothing in that that's proper, unless you're two, and then only for a year. So, <laughs> story, unity, responsibility. So, what do we have to offer as an alternative to the to a story so pathological that it's almost impossible to comprehend? That story is. One pixel. Okay. What do we have an alternative to what has happened to our natural law? Pixel representation of the world. It's all about power. It's like, that's great. You've summed up the whole world in one phrase. Have you been able to memorize that in your propaganda class in one minute? Now you have an explanation for every form of human interaction. You have a global explanation for the entire past and the present and the future. And not only that, by standing up against power, whatever that happens to be, you are now a saintly moral exemplar merely as a consequence of have swall having swallowed this one lie. It's like, plus, it's so convenient, as I said before. On the now he's turning on the sinners and calling them to repentance and transformation. 
moral front that if it's all about power, then that justifies my use of power because it's naive to think that there's anything else. Is there anything else? Yeah, there's plenty else. There's, there's all the eternal verities. There's truth and beauty and love and justice. And there's the great stories that we've been telling to one another for immense spans of time that have guided our culture and shaped our perceptions and still continue to shape our perceptions in the most fundamental way. We need to understand these stories in a manner we haven't been able to understand them before and to understand that they are describing the very means by which we perceive the world itself and that the understanding deeply contemplated by successive hundreds of generations of human beings has winnowed out for us a pathway forward if we only have the imagination and the wherewithal and the moral courage to look and to listen and to understand and most importantly to act out, to take on that responsibility, right? To confront the transforming horizon of the chaotic future, the unpredictable chaotic future, all that infinite potential there. That's where the infinite and the finite meet, right? On the horizon of the future. And to chart our course forward, guided by the better story. And as Jews in Israel, are you telling the greatest story ever told? Well, you decide that by how you live. And that decision will affect the world because everyone looks here for one reason or another. It's not so easy to understand. Everyone looks here to see, well, how are you actually doing under this tremendous assault of adversarial criticism as this little tiny people in the middle of no man's land in some real sense as a, what would you say, cardinal model of the nation state and the city on the hill. You have a tremendous... City on a hill. City on a hill cannot be hidden. Hmm. Wonder who said that. Wonder what sermon that was in. Oh, it was, it was definitely by a Jew. Yeah, it was by a Jew named Jesus and his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. Moral responsibility like you have perhaps for your entire history for reasons that are very difficult to understand. And I think it is true in some real sense that the fate of the world depends on the decisions of the people of Israel just as the fate of the world depends. <laughs> just as the fate of the world depends on the decision of every individual. So you make yourself a shining light on the hill, right? You attract people here because of what you're capable of doing. You show the world what the holy city... could look like, because we need it. We need it, and it's up to you to do it. Thank you very much. So there's a sermon. It's his sermon in Israel. So what we're seeing is this reintegration, very much natural law, reintegration of the physical world and the world of Christian values. That's, I think, what's at the heart of this whole thing which makes his ongoing biblical series and then this Constantinian post-national approach to, um, it's very, very interesting. What's interesting about Keller here is that Keller hits, um, now Keller's solution, he's got a three-point solution, another preacher here. First, as I see it, growth can happen if the church learns how to speak compellingly to non-Christian people. Yeah, you definitely got to do that. Second, the church in the U.S. can grow if it again learns how to unite justice and righteousness. Yeah, it certainly has to embody. Watch the sermon that I preached yesterday. I thought the sermon went well. I, I don't know if I should post some of those sermons. If I think they go well, I should post them on my main channel or not. One got posted by Pete accidentally a few weeks ago, and maybe I'll just finish up the Sermon on the Mount things by posting those. It talks about racial justice. Um, third, the church in the U.S. can grow again if it embraces the global and multi-ethnic character of Christianity. I, I don't. I think. I think this question of natural law is going to be far more universal than just um, the the dealing with racism. And again, I, I think part of what one of, the, one of the elements that is definitely not in the questioning of racism is exactly what Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook pulled out, is that the, the, the legacy of the Darwinian view of racism and how that impacted our implicit natural law. 
And again, when I look at, well, what are we looking at in terms of a revival, speaking outside the church, um, global? Now, again, that, that that isn't to say I don't have plenty of critiques and ideas, and I, but I think this natural law piece is key. All right, this is this has gone on long enough. I've got other stuff I got to do, but um, love to know what you think. Leave a comment.